You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a a reading of a collected work by Rudolf Steiner, number 107, entitled Disease, Karma, and Healing, Spiritual Scientific Inquiries into the Nature of the Human Being. And all 18 of these lectures are translated by Matthew Barton. Thank you very much, sir. This is lecture 18, the last in this, uh, I think we could call this a cycle, actually, given in Berlin on the 17th of June, 1909. Today we will try to enlarge a little on the manifold esoteric realities and outlooks that we have elaborated this winter. It has often been emphasized that what we call spiritual science should engage in human life and can become living actions and deeds. Today, though, let us add a little to our picture of the great evolutionary processes at work in the universe as these come to expression in the human being. And first of all, let me guide you toward a fact which, if you regard it in the right way, can be very helpful in explaining the nature of world evolution. Consider for a moment the purely external difference between human and animal development. A single word suffices to evoke the difference between the concept of animal development and that of humans. This is the word education. Education in the proper sense of the word cannot apply to animals. Of course, we can dressage and tra- we can use dressage and training to induce animals to behave in certain ways that deviate from their natural instincts, from what they possess as predisposition and comes to natural expression. But one must really be a very keen dog lover indeed to deny the radical difference between human education and what can be undertaken with an animal. In fact, we need only recall an important insight provided by our anthroposophical worldview to find a deeper basis for this initially superficial observation. We know that human beings develop gradually in a very complex way. We have repeatedly emphasized how, during the first seven years of life up to the change of teeth, the child's development unfolds in a way quite different from the next seven years, up to the age of 14, and then in a different way again from the age of 14 through to 21. I just mention this in passing, since you are aware of it. A spiritual, scientific view of things shows us that the human being is born several times as he develops. We are born into the physical world when we leave the mother's body shedding the physical mother envelope. But having done so, we know that we are still enclosed in another, a second, etheric mother envelope. As he grows toward the age of seven, what we call the child's etheric body is surrounded on all sides by external ether streams belonging to the surrounding environment. In the same way that the physical body is surrounded by the physical mother envelope until birth, This second etheric envelope is shed at second dentition, and then the ether body is born around the seventh year. At this point, however, the astral body is still enclosed in the astral envelope, which is shed at puberty. After this, the human astral body develops freely until the 21st or 22nd year, when the true eye is really first born. Only at this point, does a person awaken to full inner intensity when what has developed as I, capital, through his various former incarnations, first works its way out and emerges from within. A quite singular fact becomes apparent here to clairvoyant consciousness. If you observe a young child for a few weeks, or perhaps months, you will see that his head is surrounded by etheric and astral streams and forces. 
These etheric astral streams and forces, however, become gradually less apparent and fade after a while. What is actually happening here? In fact, you can work out what is happening without clairvoyant faculties through clairvoyance, excuse me, though clairvoyance confirms what I'm going to say. The human brain directly after birth is not the same as it is later, after a few weeks or months. While the baby already perceives the outer world, his brain does not as yet provide an instrument for combining external impressions in a particular way. Separate connecting nerves running from one part of the brain to another only develop after birth. These connective nerves, by means of which we gradually learn to link in thought what we see outside us, only slowly form after the child has been born. Let's say that a child hears a bell ring and also sees it ringing, but he will not immediately connect the auditory and visual impressions with the idea it is that bell which is ringing. He only gradually learns to do so, since the part of the brain that is the instrument for perceiving tones and the part responsible for visual perception only gradually become connected. Only then can the child appraise a situation properly and say that what he sees is also what is making the sound. Thus, connecting links are formed in the brain and the forces that enable these links to emerge and form can be seen clairvoyantly in the first few weeks as extra enveloping layers around the brain. But what envelops the brain at this point subsequently enters and lives within it. It no longer works from without, but within the brain itself. What works from without in the first few weeks of child development could not work further on the growing child's whole development if it were not protected by the various enveloping layers. You see, when what I have just described as working from without enters the brain, and is within it, it continues to develop first under the protecting envelope of the ether body and then of the astral body. Only around the age of 21 does what has worked from without until then now become active from within. What was initially outside the child in the first moments of life then slipped inside, does not work unprotected, without any envelope at all, until the age of 19 or to, uh, to 21. At that point, it becomes free and develops the intensity I spoke of. Now, let us consider for a moment this gradual process of human development. Let us compare it with the development of the plant. We know that the plant, here in the physical world, where we initially encounter it, only has a physical and ether body, and that its astral body is outside and surrounds it. Within itself it has only a physical and ether body. The plant emerges from the seed, forms its physical body, and gradually its etheric body also arises. But the plant only has this ether body. Now we saw that the human ether body still has its astral body around it up to puberty and that the astral body is only really born then. By contrast, the plant, after reaching sexual maturation, cannot give birth to an astral body of this kind, since it does not possess one. The necessary consequence of this is that at sexual maturation, the plant now has nothing more than seeds to be developed. It has fulfilled its task in the physical world once sexual maturation is achieved and dies after fertilization. In some lower animals you can see something similar. In them, unlike higher animals, the astral body is really not yet drawn right down into the physical body. Lower animals are distinguished precisely by the fact that the astral body is not yet within the physical body. Take the mayfly as an example. It develops, lives until fertilization, is fertilized, and then dies. Why? Because it is a creature whose astral body, as in the plant, is largely outside it, 
and can therefore develop nothing further once sexual maturation has occurred. In a certain respect, humans, animals, and plants develop in similar ways until sexual maturity. But the plant then has no further developmental task in the physical world and dies after sexual maturation. The animal has an astral body within it, but no eye. After sexual maturity, therefore, it still has a certain reserve of developmental potential. The astral body becomes free. And for as long as it goes on freely developing, for as long as it retains developmental potential, the animal's further development will continue after sexual maturity. Now the animal's astral body in the physical world has no eye within it. The animal's eye is a group eye, always comprising a whole group and existing in the astral world as group eye. This group eye in the astral world has quite different developmental possibilities than does the animal here in the physical world. But the astral body that the animal possesses has very limited scope for development. At birth already, the animal bears this developmental potential within it. The lion has something that comes to expression in its astral body as a sum of drives, instincts and passions. And these drives, desires and passions can come to expression in its astral body. This all lives until the point at which an I could be born. But an I is not present, existing instead on the astral plane. Therefore, when the animal has arrived at the level of a human being approaching the age of 21, its developmental potential has been exhausted. The actual length of time an animal lives naturally varies depending on circumstances. Not all animals live to be 21. But human beings up to the age of 21, when the I is born, share in what is intrinsically animal development up to that point. This does not, of course, mean that human development up to the age of 21 is animal in nature. It is not. For what becomes free at 21 is already within us from the very beginning, from conception, and is now freed. A human being is not animal in nature, because something exists in him from the beginning which becomes free from the age of 21. This I works in him from the outset, albeit in unfree form. And it is this I, in fact, that can be educated. It is this I, along with what it elaborates and develops through the astral, etheric, and physical body, that passes from incarnation to incarnation. If nothing new were added to this I at each new incarnation, we would be unable at our physical death to take with us anything from our past life between birth and death. And if we could not do so, in our subsequent life we would find ourselves on exactly the same level as in the preceding one. We continually enrich our I by virtue of the fact that we undergo a process of of development during our lifetime, acquiring and absorbing things that the animal cannot because its developmental potential is circumscribed. This means that we can rise ever higher from incarnation to incarnation. And because we bear an I within us that is not born until we are twenty-one, but which is at work in us prior to that, we can be educated and can make of ourselves something other than we are predisposed or predetermined to be from the beginning. The lion brings its lion nature with it and gives expression to it. The human being brings not only his generally human attributes as member of a species, but also what he acquired as I in his last incarnation. And this can be transformed ever more through education and life so that it is endowed with a new impetus when we pass through the gate of death and must then prepare ourselves for a new incarnation. It is this we must keep in mind, that we absorb new developmental factors and continually enhance our potential. But now, let us ask what happens really 
when we outwardly enhance ourselves through developmental factors of this kind. Here we must first try to grasp three very important concepts which are hard to comprehend. We have been working together in these branch meetings for many years now, and so no doubt it will be possible to progress to somewhat more advanced concepts. To formulate the three concepts, first consider a fully grown plant, if you like a lily of the valley. There you have the plant before you in a particular form. You could equally well have done it before you in a different form, though as a small seed. If you look at this small seed form in front of you, you can become aware that it contains everything that will later become visible as root, stem, leaves and flowers. So first I have the flower before me as a seed, and then also as a full-grown plant. Yet the seed could not lie here in front of me if it had not been created by a previous lily of the valley. But for clairvoyant consciousness, something else is also true. When clairvoyant consciousness observes the full-grown lily of the valley, it sees its physical form permeated by an ether body, the kind of body of streaming light penetrating it from top to bottom. In the case of the lily of the valley, however, the ether body does not extend very far beyond the physical body of the plant and is not much different from it. But if you take the lily of the valley's small seed, while the physical seed is small, you will find that a wondrous ether body incorporates itself into this seed in a radiant circular form. The seed itself sits at one end of the ether body, similar to the way a comet's nucleus relates to its tail. The physical seed is in fact only a concentrated point in the light or ether body of the lily of the valley. Someone who studies things from a spiritual scientific perspective will find that he has before him in the fully grown lily of the valley an unfolding of what was first hidden. In relation to the seed before him, where the physical is very small and only the spiritual aspect is large, he can say that the true being of the lily of the valley is wrapped inside the physical seed. Thus, in observing the lily of the valley, we must distinguish two different conditions. One, in which the lily of the valley's whole being is involuted, infolded, wrapped up in the seed, and another, in which this initial state unfolds and passes into evolution as the plant grows. But then the lily of the valley's whole being slips, in turn, into the new growing seed. Thus unfolding and infolding alternate in the developmental sequences of a plant's being. During unfolding or evolution, the spiritual fades increasingly, while the physical aspect becomes hugely pronounced. Then during infolding or involution, the physical will increasingly vanish, while the spiritual aspect grows ever more potent. In a sense, we can say that evolution and involution alternate in us too, but in a still more palpable way. In a human being, between birth and death, a physical body and an ether body unite in physical existence, as does the spiritual element in a certain way. As earthly human beings, we have unfolded. But when you clairvoyantly observe a human soul pass through the gate of death, he does not leave behind in physical life even as much as a lily of the valley seed. The physical vanishes so utterly that you no longer see it, and everything is infolded into the realm of spirit. The soul now passes through Devakan and is infolded in relation to his earthly being. In relation to our earthly being, we have evolution, unfolding between birth and death, and involution, infolding between death and a new birth. But there is an enormous difference between a person and a plant. In relation to the plant, we can speak of evolution and involution. But in the case of a human being, there is a third thing to consider as well. Without this third thing, we could not fully encompass a human being's whole development. 
Since the plant always passes through involution and evolution, every new plant repeats the old one, is exactly the same as it. The nature of the lily of the valley always infolds itself into the seed and unfolds again. What happens in the case of the human being? We have just acknowledged that during life between birth and death, we take up new elements of developmental potential and enhance ourselves. The human being thus differs from the plant. A person's next earthly unfolding is not mere repetition of his preceding one, but allows enhancement of his existence. What we absorb or integrate between birth and death, we also infold into what previously existed. And therefore, instead of mere repetition, what subsequently unfolds appears at a higher level. Where does what we absorb and integrate actually come from? What does it mean to acquire, absorb, and integrate a new element? Please pay very careful attention here. We are approaching a most important and most difficult concept. And there is a good reason why I am saying this in one of our last sessions, for you will have the whole summer to reflect on it. We should reflect on such concepts for months and years, for then we gradually engage with the whole profundity they contain. Where does what is continually integrated into our being originate? Let us try to make this clear through a simple example. Assume there is someone in front of you who is looking at two two others. Now, bring together everything that belongs to evolution, to unfolding. We can say of the person who stands before us and observes the other two that he has passed through former incarnations has unfolded what these past lives implanted in him. This is true also of the other two who stand facing him. But now assume that the first person takes pleasure in the way the two others are standing beside each other. The sight of these particular two people standing next to each other pleases him. Someone else might well not experience this pleasure that the first experiences in seeing these two. The pleasure he feels has nothing to do with the developmental potential of the two others, for their capacity to give pleasure to the first by standing next to each other is not something they have acquired. It is something else entirely and is due solely to the fact that he is the one standing there before them. So, here you have a person developing an inward feeling of pleasure due to the fact that these two are standing there before him. This feeling is not brought about by anything to do with evolution, with unfolding. There are things in the world which arise solely through the way realities are juxtaposed. It is not a matter of the two people being linked through karma. So now let us consider this pleasure, which the one feels through having the other two standing there side by side. Take another example. Someone is standing in a certain place and turns his gaze toward a particular constellation in the heavens. If he were standing five steps further on, he would see something different. The sight awakens a sense of pleasure in him, one that is new and original. Thus we experience a sum of realities that are entirely new and are not determined by our former development. Everything relating to the lily of the valley lies in its earlier development. But this is not true of the ways in which our surroundings act upon our soul. There are all sorts of factors that have nothing to do with a former developmental process, but which arise when certain circumstances bring us into contact with the outer world. By experiencing this pleasure, it becomes something within us, however and gives rise in our soul to something that is not predetermined by anything that has gone before. Something arises from nothing. Such creative beginnings from nothing continually arise in the human soul. These are soul experiences which we do not experience through facts or realities, but through interrelationships that we ourselves elaborate between facts. 
It is important to distinguish between experiences we acquire from realities or from interrelationships between realities. Life really falls into two aspects that interweave without clear boundaries. Experiences strictly determined by former causes, by karma, and those not karmically caused that enter fresh and new into our field of vision. For example, there are whole areas of human life that fall into this latter category. Imagine you get news that someone has stolen something. Of course, whatever may have happened is determined by certain karmic factors. But assume you have just got wind of the theft, yet do not know the person who committed it. In objective reality, it has been committed by a quite specific person, whom, however, you do not know. The thief does not approach you to say, quote, Please lock me up. I was the one who did it. Close quote. No, you have to construe the facts from all sorts of hints in a way that may tell you who the thief might be. The ideas you formulate in the process have nothing to do with the objective facts. They are dependent on quite different things, including how clever you are or not. The train of thought you formulate does not have to lead to the actual thief either, but is a process that unfolds only within you to complement external reality. Basically, all logic is something that is added to reality, as are all aesthetic judgments. So we continually enhance and enrich our lives through things that are rooted in previous causes, but, excuse me, through things that are not rooted in previous causes, but that we experience by relating ourselves in some way or or another to reality. Let me read that sentence again. So we continually enhance and enrich our lives through things that are not rooted in previous causes, but that we experience by relating ourselves in one way or another to reality. If we now take a quick journey through the whole of human life and recall how it evolved through the stages of old Saturn, old Sun and old Moon to our present Earth evolution, we find that it was not yet possible on Saturn for the human being to form such interconnections. Necessity alone prevailed. The same was true on Old Sun and Old Moon, and the way humans were on Old Moon is how things still are for animals today. The animal's experience is determined by preceding causes. Only the human being has entirely new, not previously determined experiences. This is why only humans can be educated in the true sense of the word. The human being alone keeps adding something new to what is karmically determined. Only on earth do we acquire the capacity to add something new. On old moon we had not yet evolved far enough to be able to add anything new to our original disposition and potential. Although we were not animals then either, we stood at the level of animal evolution. We were determined by outer causation in whatever we undertook. But we still are today to a certain degree, for free experiences only slowly work their way into us, doing so all the more as we raise ourselves to higher levels of evolution. Consider Raphael's paintings and imagine a dog regarding them. It will see what is objectively there, whatever arises from them in so far as they are sensory objects. But now, Imagine a human being looking at these pictures. He will see something quite different in them, something he can only conceive by having passed through former incarnations and evolved. And now take a brilliant person, a genius, someone like Goethe. He sees more still, understands the full significance of these paintings and why one is painted in one way, another in another. The more highly evolved we become, the more we perceive. Thus, the more we have previously enhanced our soul, the more we complement what we see with these kinds of interrelationships experienced in our soul. And these become soul possessions, taking root in our soul. But all this has only become possible for humanity 
since the beginning of earth evolution. The following occurs, however. As time progresses, human beings continue to evolve. We know that the earth stage will be followed by Jupiter, Venus and Vulcan. During this process of evolution, the sum of experiences we have undergone over and above preceding causes will continually increase and our inner life will grow ever richer. What we have brought with us from old causes, from Saturn, Sun and Moon evolution, will become ever less significant. We will evolve beyond former causation and cast it off. And when we have reached the planetary stage of Vulcan, we will have shed everything we absorbed and incorporated during Saturn, Sun and Moon evolution. We will have cast all this off. Now, we come to a difficult idea that I will try to explain with a metaphor. Picture yourself sitting in a car that you have either inherited or has been given to you. You take a trip in this car, but one wheel has something wrong with it, and you replace the faulty wheel with a new one. So then you have the old car with one new wheel. Now let's also assume that a second wheel develops a fault after a while so that you have to change this one too. You're now driving in the old car with two new wheels. This repeats itself until you have replaced the third and fourth wheel, then other parts of the car. It's easy to imagine that at some point the car you are driving will no longer contain anything at all of the old one. You no longer have anything left of what you inherited or were given. You sit there in the car, but really it is a new vehicle. Now transpose this to human evolution. During the Saturn times we received the germ of our physical body and gradually developed it. Then during sun evolution we acquired the ether body, during the moon stage the astral body, and during earth evolution the eye. Gradually we develop and elaborate these. But within the eye we increasingly develop new experiences casting off what we inherited, what we were endowed with during Saturn, Sun and Moon stages. And a time will come, the Venus period of evolution, when we will have shed all that the gods gave us during Moon, Sun, Saturn and the first half of Earth evolution. We will have cast all this off just as the various parts of the car were replaced in our metaphor. And we gradually replace all this with what we absorb from conditions that did not previously exist. We will not be able to arrive on Venus and maintain that everything we acquired through Saturn, Sun, Moon and Earth evolution is still there in us, for we will have shed all of this. And at the end of our evolution we will bear in us only what we ourselves have elaborated, have created out of nothing and not what was bestowed on us. This then is the third aspect that is added to evolution and involution, creation out of nothing. Unfolding, infolding, and creation out of nothing. This is what we must call to mind if we wish to grasp the whole grandeur and majesty of human evolution. And so we can understand how the gods first gave us the vehicle of our three bodies, how they gradually built this vehicle and then gave us the capacity to slowly master and overcome it so that we might cast it off bit by bit. In this process, the gods wish gradually to make us in their image as a being that can say to itself, I was given the predisposition to become what I should, but I have created a whole new entity out of these rudiments. Close quote. Great elevated spirits previously evolved what we look forward to as a great wonderful ideal, not only of self-awareness, but awareness of our self-creation. And what we will only experience in a far distant future is being evolved now by certain spirits that once participated in our evolution. During Saturn evolution, as we have seen, The thrones poured out what we call the substance of humanity, into which the spirits of personality in turn 
poured what we can call the powers of personality. But these spirits of personality, who were at that time powerful enough to pour their personality character into this substance poured out by the thrones, have since ascended ever higher. Today they have attained the stage of no longer needing physical substance for their further evolution. On Saturn they needed physical Saturn substance to be able to live at all. And this substance was, at the same time, the germ of human substance. On Old Sun they needed etheric substance which flowed out to become the human ether body. On Old Moon they needed astral substance and here in Earth evolution they need our eye. But henceforth they will need what this eye itself elaborates when we create something out of pure conditions, something that is no longer physical, ether, and astral body as such, and no longer I, but instead proceeds from the I and is produced by it. The spirits of personality will use this and are already doing so in order to live within it. On Saturn they lived in what is today our physical body, on Sun in what is our ether body, and on Moon in what is now our astral body. Since the middle of Atlantean times, they have begun to live in what human beings can bring forth as higher reality from their eye. What kinds of higher reality do people produce from their eye? There are three. First, what we call lawful thinking our logical thinking. This is something we bring toward things. If we do not merely look out into the external world, do not merely observe, not just running after the thief to find him, but allow the lawfulness inherent in our observation to dawn on us, we live in logic, true logic. Then we formulate thoughts that have nothing directly to do with the thief, and yet they may catch up with him. This logic is something that comes from us, is added by us to complement things. In giving ourselves to this true logic, the eye is creative over and above itself. Secondly, the eye is creative over and above itself when it finds pleasure and displeasure in things that are beautiful, elevated, humorous, funny. In short, in things that human beings themselves produce. Let us say you see something out in the world that strikes you as stupid and you laugh at it. The fact of your laughter itself is not in the least dependent on your karma. A dull-witted person might view the same thing you are laughing at as very astute. Your response arises from the singular outlook that you yourself have. Or, let us say, that you see a hero who is being assaulted by the world initially managing to hold his own, but perishing tragically in the end. What you observe is determined by karma, but the sense of tragedy you yourself feel as you witness it is quite new. Lawfulness or necessity in thinking is the first aspect, pleasure and displeasure the second. The third is the way in which you feel urged to act under the sway of circumstances. This too is not solely karmically determined, but arises from your relationship to the matter in hand. Let us assume that two people have a relationship in which karma determines that they have something to make amends for together. At the same time, though, the development of one of them is more advanced than that of the other. The more advanced person will make amends while the other postpones this for later, doing so at a later time. One of the two will develop goodness of heart, while the other does not participate in such feelings. Here, something new starts to develop. You must not regard everything as determined, but it depends on whether or not we allow our actions to be governed by the laws of justice and equity. Ever new things arise in our morality, in the way we fulfill our obligations, and in our moral judgment. In our moral judgment especially lies the third aspect by means of which we raise ourselves beyond ourselves, by means of which the eye increasingly makes progress. 
The eye creatively integrates this into our earthly world, and what is incorporated in this way does not fade again. What human beings creatively infuse into the earth from epoch to epoch, from age to age, as the results of logical thinking, aesthetic judgment, and the fulfillment of duties, forms an ongoing stream and provides the matter and substance in which the spirits of personality embed themselves at their present stage of evolution. Thus you live your life and develop yourself, and as you do so, the spirits of personality look down upon you and continually ask you whether you are giving them something they can use for their own evolution. In developing thought content, riches of thought, in attempting to refine and enhance our aesthetic judgment and fulfill our obligations over and above what arises from karma, in giving nourishment to the spirits of personality through these offerings, we help the corpus of these spirits of personality to become more concentrated. What do these spirits of personality embody? Something that human beings regard as abstract, the zeitgeist, the spirit of diverse epochs. Someone who takes the stance of spiritual science regards this spirit of the time as a real being. The time spirits, who are none other than the spirits of personality, process through the ages. If we look back to ancient times, to Indian, Persian, Chaldean, Babylonian, and Greco-Roman culture, and through to our own time, we find that quite apart from the diverse nations and other human differences, the presiding time spirit always changes. Five thousand years ago people thought and felt differently to now, and three thousand years ago differently again. The spirits of time or the spirits of personality are what change if we use terms drawn from spiritual science. These spirits of personality undergo an evolution in the supersensible realm, in the same way that the human race evolves in the sensory domain. But what we, the human race, unfold into the supersensible realm is food and drink for these spirits of personality. They relish it. If human beings lived without developing a rich life of thinking, without pleasure or displeasure, without a sense of duty that goes beyond merely karmic dictates, the spirits of personality would have nothing to eat, in quotes, and would grow gaunt. Thus our life stands in relation to such beings who invisibly interweave with our life, live through and in it. I said that we add something new to evolution, as it were creating out of nothing, to complement involution and evolution. But that we could not create anything out of nothing if we had not first received the causes into which we placed ourselves as in a vehicle. This vehicle was given us during Saturn evolution. Piece by piece we throw it overboard and develop into the future. But we must first have received the foundation to do so. And if the gods had not first created this foundation for us, we could not have created anything out of nothing. It is due to these strong foundations that the interrelationships we inhabit can act upon us and be truly fruitful for our further development. What in fact has become possible through our capacity to create something new from what is given, to make the interrelationships in which we are embedded into a foundation for new things that we ourselves create, to think things that go beyond the actual reality we experience around us, to feel more than stands purely objectively before us, what has become possible through our capacity to act over and above the dictates of karma and to live with a sense of obligation toward truth, equity and goodness of heart? The human capacity to think logically, to develop necessity and lawfulness in thinking, also gave rise to the possibility of error. The human capacity to to take pleasure in beauty 
also made it possible to engraft what is ugly or sullied upon world evolution. Our capacity to develop and embrace a concept of duty over and above mere karma also created the potential for evil, for rejecting our obligations. Precisely through our potential for creating more than is bestowed on us by circumstances, to be creative within them, we have been transposed into a world in which we can also create and weave our spiritual substance in a way that renders it full of error, ugliness, and evil. And more than just making it possible for human beings to create at all out of their circumstances, their interrelationships, it had to be made possible for them gradually to create truth and beauty from given conditions by their striving and struggling, gradually to create the virtues that can really enable us to progress in evolution. In Christian esotericism, Creating something new from given conditions is called, quote, creating in the spirit, close quote. While creation drawn from right or true, beautiful and virtuous conditions is called the, quote, Holy Spirit, close quote. The Holy Spirit inspires us when we are able to create truth, beauty and goodness out of nothing. But the foundation necessary for us to become capable of creating in accord with this Holy Spirit first had to be bestowed on us, as for all creation, out of nothing. This foundation was given us through Christ's entry into our evolution. When we were able to experience the Christ event on earth, we became able to ascend to creation in the Holy Spirit. It is therefore Christ himself who creates the fullest, deepest foundation If we can stand upon the ground of the Christ experience so that Christ becomes the vehicle into which we enter to evolve further, Christ sends us the Holy Spirit and we become able to create what is right, beautiful and good in harmony with the further course of evolution. Thus, in a sense, as ultimate conclusion of what was imprinted into us through Saturn's sun and moon evolution, we see how the Christ event on earth endowed us with the highest aspect, enabling us to work our way into a future perspective and increasingly to create something new over and above given circumstances, drawing not on what exists here or there as a given, but instead arises from how we relate to the facts of our environment, which is the Holy Spirit in the broadest sense. That, in turn, is an aspect of Christian esotericism. Christian esotericism is connected with the profoundest idea we can have of all evolution, with the idea of creating out of nothing. This is why no true theory of development can ever dispense with the idea of creation out of nothing. If only unfolding and infolding obtained, there would be eternal repetition, as we see in the plant, and on Vulcan there would only exist what commenced on Saturn. But unfolding and infolding are complemented by creation out of nothing at the midpoint of our development. After Saturn, Sun and Moon stages pass away, Christ descends to Earth as the great enriching, enhancing element that will lead to something entirely new appearing on Vulcan, something that did not exist on Saturn. Those who speak only of unfolding and infolding regard development in terms of the endless recurring of everything, an endlessly repeating cycle. Such cycles, though, can never properly explain the evolution of the universe. Only when we add to unfolding and infolding development this creation out of nothing, which incorporates something new into given conditions, do we really start to understand the world. Lower entities reveal at most a hint of what we can call creation out of nothing. A lily of the valley repeatedly gives rise to more lilies of the valley. At most a gardener may externally add something to the lily of the valley, 
that it would never otherwise have developed by itself. Then the plant could be called a creation out of nothing. We human beings, though, are capable of incorporating this creation out of nothing into ourselves. We only become capable of this, though, by raising ourselves to this freedom of self-creation through the freest deed we look upon as our example and paradigm. What freest deed is this? It is that the wise creating word of our solar system took the inner resolve to enter a human body and participate in the earth's evolution, to enact a deed that lay in no preceding karma. When Christ resolved to enter a human body, he was not compelled to this by any preceding karma, but took it upon himself as a free deed. This was founded solely on a prefiguring vision of the future evolution of humanity, which had never previously existed, but first arose in him as a prefiguring thought created out of nothing. This is a difficult idea. But Christian esotericism will never be able to ignore it. And everything depends on our capacity to add the idea of creation out of nothing to that of unfolding and infolding development and evolution. If we are able to do so, we also acquire great ideals for life. These may not extend to cosmic dimensions, but instead basically relate to the question of why we come together in an anthroposophical society. To understand the purpose of this society, we need to return once more to the idea that we work for the spirits of personality, for the time spirit. When we enter this world at birth, we are first brought up and educated by the most diverse circumstances. These work upon us, forming the prelude to our own self-creative activity. It would be so helpful for people to realize that the fact they are born in a particular place and that particular circumstances work upon them is indeed a prelude, a preparatory stage. These circumstances exert a suggestive influence. Let us try to imagine how differently a person would be affected by being born, say, in Rome or Frankfurt instead of Constantinople. His circumstances would be different also as regards religion which accordingly might lead him to become a somewhat fanatical Catholic or Protestant. But if a small cog had turned in the karmic continuum and he was born in Constantinople instead, he might well become a proper Turk. Here's just one example of the suggestive way in which environmental circumstances can work on us. But we can work our way out of merely suggestive conditions and unite with others in accord with self-chosen insights and principles, knowing why we are working with these other people. Then from our conscious awareness arise social connections in which material is created for the spirits of time, of personality. The anthroposophical society is one such, a context of interrelationships founded on fraternity. This means nothing other than each person working to create the society by acquiring on a small scale all the good qualities which make him a reflection of the society as a whole. In other words, he offers up the ideas, the richness of feelings and virtues he develops through the society as sustenance to the spirits of personality. A society of this kind combines what creates human coexistence with the principle of individuality. Through such a society, each individual is rendered capable of offering up to the spirits of personality what he produces or creates. And each member works toward the perspective adopted by its most advanced proponents, whose spiritual schooling has led them to embrace the following ideal. Quote, When I think I do not do so for my own satisfaction, but so that the spirits of personality may draw sustenance from my thoughts. I place my best, my most beautiful thoughts upon the altar of the spirits of personality. And what I feel is not felt out of egoism, but rather I feel 
so that this may be nourishment for the pers- spirits of personality. And likewise, the virtues I manage to practice, I do not practice in order to be highly regarded, but to offer up my sacrifice, to create sustenance for the spirits of personality. Close quote. In seeking to do this, we make our ideal those we call the masters of wisdom and of the harmony of feelings. For this is the way they think, preparing a form of human evolution which will increasingly enable us to create ever new things and ultimately to evolve a world of effects from which all old causes have vanished and from which a new light shines out toward the future. The world is not subject to continuous change in which it assumes entirely different forms, but instead the old perfects itself. And this improvement to the old becomes the vehicle of the new. Then, however, this vehicle is cast away and vanishes into nothing, so that the new can emerge from this nothing. This is the mighty idea of progress, in which something new can always and continually arise. But worlds are self-contained, and you have seen from the example I have given that we cannot, in fact, speak of the ultimate demise of anything. We have seen how the spirits of personality lose their effect on us on the one hand, but on the other take up their evolution again. And so we have a world that always rejuvenates itself, but of which we can say that whatever is cast off would prevent further progress and instead is bestowed upon another so that he in turn can progress. No one should believe he must inevitably let something fall away into nothing because he has been endowed with the capacity to create out of nothing. But what will appear as the new on Vulcan will continually create new forms and cast off the old. And what is cast off in this way will seek its own further path. Unfolding, infolding, and creation from nothing are the three concepts by means of which we should seek to understand the true nature of the development of the world and its phenomena. Only by this means do we properly arrive at concepts that explain the world to us and give us feelings of inwardness. You see, if a person has to tell himself that he can only create what is implanted in him as cause, and this alone can come to expression in him, This idea will be unable to steal his powers and kindle his hope to the same extent as realizing he can create living values and continually add new elements to the foundations given to him. We can then see that the old will not prevent us from creating new blossoms and fruits that survive into the future. And this is a part of what we can characterize by saying that the anthroposophical worldview gives people living forces, living hope, and confidence for life by showing them that they can help shape the future, not only of things arising from the realm of causation, but of others that as yet do not exist, that lie in the realm of nothing. And this truly offers us the prospect of working our way from being a creature to being a creator. That is the end of Lecture 18 and the end of the book, Disease, Karma and Healing, Spiritual Scientific Inquiries into the Nature of the Human Being, number 107 in the Collected Works of Dr. Rudolf Steiner, translated by Matthew Barton.